This class is in memory of Jared Ochen, and we will today start to learn on page 953. Parshat Shoftim. Shoftim is a long parsha with a lot of laws. We will concentrate on a few things here, and we'll take it from there. Chapter the monarchy, the monarch. Want to read? When you come to the land that God your Lord has given you so that you have occupied it and settled it, you will eventually say, we would like to appoint a king just like all the nations around us. Let's stop right here. You'll come to the land and God is, Moses is predict, predicting the future. He says you will want to be like anybody around you. That's the biggest problem of the Jewish people. They always try to copy other nations. And he says, and you will say you want a king, not because you want a king that is from the house of David and he will be a holy man and he will tell us what God wants. We want a king to be like everybody else. You know, when, when uh, Yitzhak Rabin was, when the Rebbe was 70 years old, he celebrated his 70th birthday, Yitzhak Rabin was at that time, um, he was an ambassador of Israel in the UN, in, in Washington. American ambassador, and he came with the name of Israeli government to wish the Rebbe in honor of his 17th birthday. The first question the Rebbe is asking him, how you, do you feel lonely in Washington as the one who represents the Jewish people against under, another 140 nations who represented the Washington? Then the Rebbe went on into a whole thing about Am Levadad Ishkon. The Jewish people are a lonely nation. They are lonely. Badad means lone. The Rebbe asked them, is this because everybody hates us, because of anti-Semitism, or because we are really, we want to be different? And after a whole discussion, the Rebbe came to the conclusion that it's a combination. We want to be different, and the world helps us to be different. Then Am Nevadad Ishkon is a line that said the gentle prophet. Bilam, he said this word. And the Jewish people, and it's true until now, here it's what we learn now here is something about how the Jewish people will say, we don't want to be Le'va'am Levadadishkon. We don't want to be different. We want to be like everybody. We want to have a Maccabi Tel Aviv to play sports and to play basketball and to be like everybody. But you can't. We don't know how to play basketball. You're the only Jew is tall. <laughs> <coughs> then it doesn't work. And here it says, here is the same problem, the same issue is, continue, you must. You must then appoint the king whom God your Lord shall choose. You must appoint a king from among your brethren. You may not appoint a foreigner who is not one of your brethren. It says to be a king who is Jewish. But not only is Jewish, as we learn, as we will written later, it says to be from, from the tribe of Judah. Not only from the tribe of Judah, from the house of David. But he says it must be from not a foreigner, it cannot be a stranger. It's to be one of yours. Must, you must appoint a king. Actually, and then the king, he says, the, here he the king has, the, has much more power than a prophet. You see, a prophet or a Jewish leader, he rules by, by the authority, he, he gets his authority from spirituality, from God, that it's authority of mercy and love. He doesn't get the authority from his people. A king gets the authority from his people. The people are not spiritual. The people give him <coughs> muscles. <coughs> then a king can take you, can mobilize you, and can take away your property. He can do whatever he wants. Nobody can stop him. By Jewish law, anybody goes against the king deserves death. There's no chokhmes. A king is a king. As long as you have a prophet who is drawing his powers from God, God is merciful, then the prophet is merciful. The moment you appoint a king from you, he gets you power. What is your power? This. That, 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 that's the way it looks like. And then when the Jewish people came to King to Samuel and told him, appoint for us a king like any other nation, the same thing they said. They actually lived up to Moses' prediction. Samuel warned them, my friend, until now, you're the, you're the, you're the field day. You did whatever you want. The king, the, the, Samuel was a guy, before he died, he said, who can, tell, who can testify against me that I took from him one donkey? He never took from anybody anything. He says, a king, 
or to give children to the army. And the best of them will be his advisors. And he will marry your girls as best as you want. And he will take your field and he confiscate this. And he'll do whatever he wants. He's a king. In the name of the king, if he's doing it for the sake of the kingdom, if it's a part of the system, he can do everything. He is the ruler. He makes the rules and everybody has to live by the rules. Here, the Torah tells them, because the Torah is afraid that the king has too much power, the Torah tells them, the king, however, the king, however, must not accumulate many horses, so as not to bring the people back to Egypt to get more horses. God has told you that you must never again return on that path. He also must not have many wives, so that they not make his heart go astray. He shall likewise not accumulate very much silver and gold. Okay, that he should not accumulate too many horses, because he might go back to Egypt. He should not accumulate too many wives. How much is too many? More than 18. 18, more than 18. That's the Jewish law. For the rest of us, one. For a king. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, and then he should not too much gold, uh, silver and gold. Okay. Okay, Solomon violated one, two, and three. <laughs> strike one, strike two, strike three. The Talmud says something very interesting. The Talmud says, the Jewish people, so to speak, tell God, God, why don't give us reasons for the, for the mitzvahs? There's no reasons why to keep Shabbos, or to put on film. Do this, do this, do this, do this, make a breeze. Not, there's no reasons in the Bible. Very few reasons there in the Bible. Then God said, so to speak, to the Jewish people, I give you two mitzvahs, and I gave the reasons. He said, do not accumulate too many horses, because the center of the horses at that time was in Egypt. If you get too involved in horses, you go to the center, you become a bigger maven, and you want the better thing, and you want the real, then you go back to Egypt. You will not accu uh, accu don't, don't have too many women because they'll uh, take you astray. Okay, uh, and, right? Two reasons. Solomon said to himself, oh, God says the reasons. I'll be okay. I'll, I, I, will, I, will, I, can, I, can, I can do it. I will accumulate all this. To me, it's not going to happen. You know, everybody says, to me, it's not going to happen. Don't worry, I'm stronger than that. It's not going to happen to me. Guess what? It happened. And God said, so to speak, I gave you two mitzvahs and I gave the reasons. And you failed. Actually, mitzvahs that we don't have the reason, we do better. Mitzvahs that we have reasons, we, we, we try to... You, you ask people, why don't keep kosher? Oh, the hygiene, it was hygiene, it was lost then because uh, it was to protect us, that food shouldn't get spoiled. Now that we have refrigerators so we know how to clean the food, we don't need it. The moment there is a reason, right there comes the excuse. The moment there is no reason, I cannot give an excuse. Why not? I don't know why not. If I would know why to do it, I would find a reason why not. The moment there is no explanation, then in reality, Jewish people observe more the mitzvahs they do not have a reason than the mitzvahs that they have a reason. More people observe the Brit Milah, the circumcision, than mitzvahs are much easier to do. Because there is no reason. You have to do it, why? Because that's, that's it, so finished. If not, you, know, you don't feel Jewish. You, know? you feel like you're all not here. Okay, what else has to, the king has to do to make sure he doesn't go astray? Continue. When, when the king is established on his royal throne, he must write a copy of this Torah as a scroll edited by the Levitical priests. This scroll must always be with him, and he shall read from it all the days of his life. He will then learn to be in awe of God his Lord, and carefully keep every word of this Torah and these rules. He will then also not begin to feel superior to his brethren, and he will not stray from the mandate to the right or the left. He and his descendants will thus have a long reign in the midst of Israel. And what the Torah says, he needs to have a little Sefer Torah with him. Goes with him every year. As my mind is put, he sit down by the table to eat, the Torah is next to him. Whatever he's doing, the Torah is next to him. He should never forget about learning the Torah. The, he, he needs a special fear. A regular person doesn't need a Torah next to him. Because a regular person, the power doesn't get to his head. He doesn't have too much power. A king, because everybody listens to him, he can't start to convince himself that he's God. That's what happened to power corrupts. A lot of power corrupts you much more. Then that's why the, the security for the king to be, they were king in Israel, were very humble. 
and they had the Torah next to them, and they were very always reminded themselves that they are just representative of God. Actually, King David was one of them. He used to say to God, God, for you is the power. It's not me. I was a nobody. You took me out from nowhere, from being a shepherd, and you appointed me as a king. That's a story. That's the loss of a king. But now we'll go turn them on this page back, one page back. And we'll read. We see why shouldn't it make him bring horses? Because so he is not to bring the people back to Egypt to get more horses. Why? Because God has told you that you must never again return on the pet. Not allowed to go back to Egypt. Where are we? A bunch of our people headed back there. Wait, 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 wait. After World War II, the were rabbis who wanted to make a law that Jews are not allowed to step foot in Germany. Spilled so much blood. So terrible. So bad. Shouldn't go back to Germany. And they proved the, the proof was, if the Torah says do not go back to Egypt, should, because they spilled so much blood, shouldn't go back to Germany either. But the smarter rabbis, the more, the more, the older, the one who are a little more, who see things a little further, and don't get all worked up, says that he cannot do this. First of all, why? First of all, from a regular point of view, he said, only in the time of the Talmud, the rabbi said the power to make rules that will affect all the Jewish people. Today, nobody has, the, nobody has this authority to affect everybody. Which aloha, what? It says the judge in your day. Yeah. Forget that. Which aloha is that the rabbis made and affected all the Jewish people in the time of the Talmud? What type of, of uh, ban, of decree, of institution they made that they affects the whole Jewish people? Not a biblical law. Like candles. That was really done early. Even later like a band, not to do something. What do you think? What's there is something in Jewish law that the rabbis of the Talmud established and all the Jews practice it? Not to eat milk with chicken meat. Mm -hmm. The Jewish law is not to eat meat with beef. Beef meat, you cannot eat with milk. That's a biblical law. The rabbis came and said that the, because chicken looks like the meat can look like this, therefore you should not eat meat uh, chicken meat with milk. It's not a biblical law. And actually, there is a famous uh, Talmudic statement that Rabbi Yossi Aglili, he, he didn't accept this law. In his town, they ate milk with chicken meat until he died. By then, he said, <laughs> everybody is it's a part of everybody, and this is the law to everybody. Since then, for 2,000 years, we do not, God forbid, milk, mix mi milk and, and chicken, right? Later, Rabbis made laws that became a law of everybody. Wood law is only for Ashkenazic Jews, for example. More than Rice. one wife. Huh? Yeah, more than one wife. And what you said? Rice. Rice, these yeah. two laws are a perfect example. Rice, Ashkenazic Jews do not eat rice. Sephardic Jews eat rice. Why? Because Ashkenazic rabbis made the law. The Sephardic Jews say, it's not my authority. Have a nice day. I don't have to listen to you. The same thing is with uh, not marrying more than one wife. The Yemenite Jews do it. There are even practices of this in Israel today when there is, when, when by a Sephardic Jew, when his first wife, let's say, is very sick and she cannot receive a get, or he doesn't want to give her a get because he doesn't want to hurt her, then the rabbis will allow him to marry a second wife, so to speak, because the Sephardic Jews are allowed. Then we see there, there, there is a, even Rabbeinu Gershom, who lived over a thousand years, cannot make a law that will affect everybody. Then the rabbis after the Holocaust want to make a law that every Jew is going to accept not to step foot over in, in Germany. And besides, if you're a little smart and you know that people not listen, you, you, don't, you don't do laws that people not listen. That's in general a smart idea for any rabbi in, in any situation. Now, more than that, 
according to Maimonides, the law not to go back to Egypt is not to move back to Egypt. But to go to do business, let's say, in Egypt, you're allowed. To travel? Yeah, you're allowed. To travel, to visit, yes. Not allowed to move back to Egypt. He says, you want to make a law that nobody is ever allowed to step foot in Germany? You want to go even further than the Bible about Egypt? So you were going to walk. And that's why nothing was happening. The idea of, of uh, not buying uh, German products, uh, the Rebbe writes it's a matter of fulfilling. Where a person wants to have a strong, uh, people have a strong feeling about it, God bless them. But he can, even, this is, even this is not something that you, you'll tell other people not to do. You don't want to do it, God bless you. It's, the Rebbe said it's a forum of, it's kind of a forum of remembering the Amalekites, so to speak. Remember the people who did bad to you, that's written in the Bible. If you want to remember and not buy German products, fine. But even this is not the end of the world. Not at all. Then this is the story with Germany. But what's the, to what's, what, what's the story with Egypt? We all see it's written that we're not allowed to live in Egypt, to go back to Egypt. We're in the Bible. It's written we're not allowed to go back to Egypt. Right after we got out in the Red Sea. That's a good idea, yeah, by the Red Sea. That's a good place to look for, yes, right there. On page 325, actually. Um, 323. The Jewish people saw how the Egyptians are coming closer, right? They turned to Moses and complained. A number um, 11, the Israelites cried out to God. They said to Moshe, you who was supposed to read? The, they said to Moses, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? Why did you have to bring us out there to die in the desert? How could you do such a thing to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't they tell you in Egypt to leave us alone? and that let us war for the Egyptian. It would have been better to be slaves in Egypt than to die here in the desert. That's what they complained. What Hashem answered them, what Moshe Rabbeinu answered them, in the bottom of page 323. Don't but, be afraid, replied Moses to the people. Stand firm, and you will see what God will do to rescue you today. You might be seeing the Egyptians... Today... Today, but you will never see them again. God will fight for you, but you must remain Today, silent. Moses says, you will never see them again. It means you're not allowed to go back to Egypt. Oh, Jeremiah the prophet. Wait a second. There is one more place that's written in the Torah beside here and in our parsha. There is one more place that's written in the Torah. You're not allowed to go back to Egypt. Where is it? Did he mean only this generation or forever? That's a good question. We'll get to it. Good thinking. We all see written in the Bible. You know, and Ezra think. takes them out? In the Bible, no, in the Bible. Oh, okay. Closer to the end. You know the curses? Mm -hmm. All the curses that, that Moses is giving by the end of the of the Pashat Kitavo. Tells them there a whole list of curses, terrible. What's the worst? On page 10, a hundred uh, and a thousand and nine. A thousand and nine. Number 68. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Number 68, 60, on um, top of the page. Okay. God will bring you back to Egypt in ships along the way that I promised you would never see again. You will try to sell yourselves as slaves and maids, but no one will want to buy you. The, the worst, this is the end of the curses. The worst curse is God will bring you back to Egypt in ships. 
along the same way where he promised you you would never see them again. That's exactly what he promised them in the split with the splitting of the sea. And could be there's even written in other places. And God says we will never go back to Egypt. And guess what? We were always in Egypt. Since the time of the second temple. Yeah. The beginning of the second temple, that was already, Jews were in Egypt even before that, obviously. There is a famous story we spoke about in the beginning of the second temple, was Shimon Atzadik was the first high priest in the time of the second temple. After four years of his priesthood, or something like this, he died, he had two sons. Chonyo and what's the other guy's name? I don't remember his name. In any case, they had a fight who should become the high priest. One became the high priest in the temple in Jerusalem. The other one ran away to Egypt and established a temple in Egypt that stood for 236 years, something like this. And let me see. And that was, it was one of the suburbs of Cairo, not far from Cairo. And there was the temple. And that was the richest Jewish community at that time in, in the world was in Egypt, not in Jerusalem. And therefore, even uh, the people in Jerusalem didn't protest too strongly about against the temple in Egypt because you don't fight against the richest Jews, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what they said, there is a rule that anybody who, is, who, is, who, who served any Kohen who served in the temple in Egypt will not serve in Jerusalem. It's like a punishment, like a... If you go there, don't come here. But was a temple and it was for many years there was a Jewish community and then for many years later who is the most famous Jew was in Egypt? My man it is. My friend I think I, yeah, I didn't know that Philo is Jewish I'm sorry I don't know <laughs> Philo is and I know Philo is Jewish. <laughs> Obviously not the most famous by the way the most famous rabbi in history is my man and he makes a point in the Rebbe's, in the, in the in Tlushkin makes a point in one of his notes in the Rebbe's book that the Rebbe, after Maimonides, the Rebbe is the next most famous rabbi among Jews and non-Jews. There was never between Maimonides and the Rebbe, nobody else that is no, so known. I mean, the Gentiles don't know about Rashi. Okay. I mean, Maimonides, everybody knows. That Maimonides lived in Egypt all his life and Maimonides came to Israel. And you know, he saw there is nothing going on in Israel. <laughs> but he didn't live there his whole life. Did no, he no. come from Spain? He came yeah. from Spain. Right. Yeah. Morocco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he came to, he came for a short visit in Israel. And he, most of his adult life, I mean, as a rabbi, as a leader, he was in Egypt. He was the doctor of the caliph. And the whole thing. Then Maimonides, the Rebbe Maimonides alone was in Egypt. And the Torah says three times, do not go back to Egypt. Then they say, there is, a, there is some rabbi say that Maimonides, they, they, they never found such a letter, but they said that Maimonides used to sign these letters. The one who disobeyed the three loving, the three knows, that's written in the Bible of not living in Egypt, the one who disobeyed every day the three laws. That's how he felt. But the question is, how he did it? No, what do you think? Any good answers? Well, it's like you were saying. It's it's yeah. It's not it's not the same Egypt, obviously. Mm -hmm. Oh, that first of all, there are mitzvahs in the Torah who are, who are given for this generation. Yeah. What is an example of a mitzvah in the Torah that's given for this generation? I think you want to Malek. This generation? No, Malek is not a mitzvah for one generation. Yeah, you just but you're do supposed not to, you're supposed to kill. The yeah. Malik, you just don't uh, know who they are. Yeah, you don't, you then it's not, the mitzvah didn't change. The reality changes. That's many mitzvahs, like a sabbatical and jubilee. And many yes. But where is a mitzvah that was a temporary mitzvah when we left Egypt? Not to buy Jerusalem. No. It's not a mitzvah. A temporary mitzvah? To eat, eat mana? Bread. Mana, if you would have mana today, you're allowed to eat it. <laughs> what would be a mitzvah? That was given for that generation. A one time mitzvah in the Bible. Picking up the Canaanites? No, it's not. A, if you would have a Canaanite today, you should also have to <laughs> clean it up. <laughs> you guys know it. A mitzvah that yeah, was for that time. 
Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I'll tell. What is so it's a mitzvah for them, but not now. Is that what you're saying? It was one time mitzvah. God gave us one time mitzvah. For the Mishkan? To, uh... In essence, you have to build a Mishkan every day in your life. We, have, we are obligated to build a Mikdash now. We just cannot do it because uh, the mask is on top of it. There is technical reasons why I cannot do it. But the mitzvah is a permanent mitzvah. The lamb Passover? Very good. What was the lamb? We had to take the lamb four days before. And we had to put the oil, <coughs> uh, blood on the two posts, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now, we, every year, we have to take the lamb every Pesach, not four days before. That was a mitzvah that was given, and the, and the, do, and the blood on the doorpost was a one-time mitzvah. That some opinions say, the Rabbeinu Bechaye says, that the mitzvah of going, not going back to Egypt was for that generation. Not for every generation. God told them, you will not see Egypt again. Not everybody. Not forever and ever. That's one opinion. That's one explanation. But that's not the only explanation. The second explanation is why we don't have to kill the Amalekites today. You know, there is a law. We cannot marry an Egyptian until three generations. I think it's written, it's written in the Bible, right? For three generations, you cannot marry an Egyptian. There is quite a few laws what type of people we're not allowed to marry. That if it means to say, for example, remember the story of the Moabite, who the Moabite? Mm-hmm. It's written in the Torah. A Moabite and an Ammonite should not be a part of the Jewish people, right? Then how are you married today? Any non-Jew convert? You're talking about somebody converts, converts by Jewish law, goes to the mikveh, goes to the old prophet, the old process, still you're not allowed to marry him if he's an Ammonite or a Moabite. Today, why are you allowed to marry? Maybe he's an Ammonite and a Moabite. The answer, the answer is, that was a king Sancheriv. Are you saying the name of Sancheriv? Sancheriv. Sancheriv yeah. was a king. He came and he conquered the whole world. Mm-hmm. And he, what his philosophy was, he moved the populations, transferred. He moved the people from Solon to New York, the people from New York to Solon. He moved everybody around. Why? Nobody should ever be able to claim that it is place. Oh, I have my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, 20 generations. Nobody can say it. It all belongs to me, to the king. That the moment Sancheriv came, the Bilbel et Aolam, he mixed up the world. Then we don't know who is on. Then we don't know that, the, uh, when was it? Assyria. Sancheriv, the, uh, Sancheriv was the, the end the of tribes. the first temple, 2,600 years ago, around. Then Sancheriv came and, and messed up the world, and he conquered the, 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 the lost ten tribes brought by Sancheriv. He conquered them, and he mixed them up. He moved them. Why we think today that the ten tribes are in, uh, in Ethiopia and other places, they are descendants of the ten tribes? Because Sancheriv's philosophy was not to kill anybody, just to move them around, take them to a different place of the world. They will never remember that there was Israel. And the moment Sancheriv came and mixed up the world, the Egyptian of today are not the, Egypt, the original Egyptian. What God said? God said, Eretz Mitzrayim lo ta'asun. Do not behave like the Egyptian. Don't learn their bad behavior. God didn't want us to go back to Egypt because the original Egyptian were mean people, they tortured the Jewish people, they were morally uh, corrupted and so on and on, that God didn't want us to learn from the Egyptian. What if the Egyptian of today are not the Egyptian of once upon a time, you're allowed to go back to Egypt. That's the second explanation. But you know what the real explanation is? That beggars cannot be choosers. That's the real explanation. The reality is stronger than everything. The Jewish people in most of our history no one, nobody wanted us. And the Pharisees who wanted us, they couldn't make a living. Then it was finally one place who wants us, and we can make a living, we went to live them. That's the realities of life. And that's why, even why Mamanides went to Egypt. Because he, he felt an obligation, it was a huge Jewish community, very influential, 
and they started to assimilate. And he knew that if he doesn't go there and to stop the, the train of assimilation, it will be over. So when it comes to such an issue, you, don't, you, 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 are, you know that what Hashem said, not go back to Egypt, that you go in, in your mind at a temporary way of thinking. We are not here to stay. You know, in, many, in history, many times, Jews did not build big synagogues because they were in the thought of they are moving, they are, they are under suitcases, so to speak. That's why the bottom line is, it was very hard. It was a matter of survival. When it comes to a matter of survival, you have no choice. Even by Jewish law, allows you to go there. That's the reason why we were in Egypt. Why we lived in Egypt for so many years. Even when it's written in the Torah, do not go back to Egypt. But the question is, why not? Why not to go back to Egypt? What's the spiritual reason? What's the Kabbalistic reason why we shouldn't go back to Egypt? What's the about Egypt? It's a source of idolatry. That's the only place. Okay. A Kabbalistic okay. reason? Yeah, what's the Arizal reason? Yeah. You know, you ever heard about Birur Anitzotzot? Birur Anitzotzot means to elevate the sparks. In everything that you do, you elevate a spark. It means to say there is a spark of God in the table and in the chair and in the paper and in the book and in the food that you eat. Let's take the food is a good example. You're taking a piece of meat. It was a living thing that was there. An animal lived, right? It was a, was, a, was a life there. In this piece of meat, there is a spark of God. When I say a brocha before I eat the piece of meat and I eat it for the sake of God, I bring the piece of meat to his purpose. So to speak, the killing of the animal was not in vain. The life of the animal was not in vain. Every purse, everything has a purpose in the world. By bringing it to his purpose, you fulfilled his mission. You elevated, you brought the spark of God to his correction, to his, to his destination, if you want. What is our justification to eat meat? People, people don't eat meat. They're like, they say, how could you kill another animal? They have a point. The vegetarians have a point. But I'll take it a little further. What about fish? You have to kill fish? They will tell you, you should sorry, you shouldn't eat fish. Fine. You're allowed to take off an apple from the tree, you cut off him from his source of life. Who gave you permission to do that because he doesn't scream? That what is the proof that he doesn't feel? The fish doesn't skim either. Because he doesn't dance around, it means he doesn't have life. You cut him off from the tree, he's dying. Who we'll gave you permission to do this? Who we'll go even further? You walk over the carpet, maybe the carpet should walk over you. Who we'll gave you the right to sit on the chair? Maybe the chair should sit on you. Because the chair cannot talk, therefore gives me the right to do it and whatever I want is to say there is a real reason for the same reason that we need to have a right to take a life of an animal we need to have a right to enjoy anything in the world now what is the right for it what gives us the justification to enjoy everything that we have there we come around we take this we do this we do what, what is this it's yours who give you permission because you're stronger someone stronger than you will come take your life to be good because he's stronger. That was the world, the ancient world. That's ISIS. Whoever stronger kills the, the one who's less stronger. The answer is, is that's all hierarchy, huh? and everything is created to serve a higher level. The domain, how you translate domain? Domain is an uh, object that cannot, like a stone that cannot move. Uh, eminent? Inanimate. 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 The inanimate is here to serve all the above it, to serve the trees that grows, that grows from the earth, to serve the animals that walk, and they, they walk and eat from the, and from the and, and enjoy the inanimate things, and to serve people. The trees are here. The tree does not have a purpose for itself, if you think about it. The tree, you ever saw a tree who just enjoy its life? Ha! Ah, I'm laying down, I'm rubbing my back. <laughs> the whole purpose of the tree is his fruit. 
Whatever the food is, some trees are good for the environment, are drying up the land, some food. Are, every tree has a purpose. The tree does not, it's actually in our parsha, we are compared to the tree of the, to the, tree of the field. What does this mean? One of the examples is that we are compared to the tree, like the tree doesn't live for itself, so too the person does not live, for, does not live to enjoy, just to enjoy life. He, he has a purpose, to bring food. That the tree, that the tree is here to give to give food for some to serve the higher level in hierarchy, to serve everything that's living. And the animals are here to benefit from the trees and benefit from the from the ground from everything that's there. Now all these three levels, the inanimate, the trees, the the vegetation, and the living things, are here to serve the human being. Then we can benefit from the we can benefit from animals in many ways, not just in uh, killing them by the meat. You write an horses. That was the only way people were uh, moving from one place to another. That was the only actually to a point. Animals suffer much less today than were before. They were all the hard work was done with animals, plowing and, and traveling everything. They are here to serve the human being, and I am the king of the universe. And what I am here for? to serve my creator. Mm-hmm. Now, if I serve my creator, I justify my walking on the carpet, my enjoying the food, taking off the food on the tree, cutting them off from his force of life, fishing the fish, eating the meat, using the skin of the meat for, of the animal for, for, for a Torah or for a mezuzah. Because I'm doing it not for my own purpose, for a higher purpose. Then I bring everything for his purpose. All this for, we are all of us here for a destination, for a purpose. But the tree cannot arrive to his destination without me. The animal cannot arrive to his destination without me. And the chair and the table cannot arrive to the destination without me. And we have an unbelievable power. We can take this animal who lived to be 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, and bring it to his purpose, or bring it down for nothing. And it's up to us. Then we are, by using everything that we use in life, bringing it to his purpose, we are elevating the spark of God that gives life to this object. Everything is life, right? Look to a microscope, everything moves. There is life in everything. If not, it wouldn't exist. Bringing it to its purpose to serve God. That when I eat a piece of cake, you think I like chocolate. The truth is, I need to elevate the spark of God that's in the chocolate to help him to come to his purpose. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> That's because I like chocolate. That means that the purpose is not fulfilled. <laughs> How I know that I have to elevate only one piece of chocolate and not ten? As much as I as I'm ever craving, that's how much God wants me to elevate. That's all a part of the system. So you elevating it in the sense of serving a, a purposeful sense that the chocolate helps you to become happier, which motivates you to study Torah. Yes, which then, yes, yes. Okay. But if the chocolate motivates me to go crazy, then I brought it down. Exactly this. Even alcohol, if you take a lechaim and it gives you a little more inspiration to be a better Jew, to daven better, to learn Torah, to dance on Simchas Torah a bit more joy, that's, that's what's good. But if the alcohol makes you to, to release all your animal side and to, maybe should, I should go crazy, then, then I brought the alcohol down. Me, myself, and the alcohol down. Then a human being, the whole world is dependent on the end of the human being. That's why we are the crown of creation. We can bring it up or we can bring it down. Now we'll go back to Egypt. God took us to Egypt to elevate the spark. Why are we going to exile? We are going to exile to elevate the place. God created a world and it stands like this. Huh? God needs that somebody should come by the water, by the well, and take a cup of water and say a bracha. Recognize that this well belongs to God. That so could be. There is a story. Yeah, go ahead. No, uh, what, what, the 
purpose that we're talking about maybe is that you go to elevate Egypt, the sparks. Everything is to elevate to make it holy then. Absolutely, to make so it holy. To make the land of Egypt holy now. Absolutely, to make it holy. Now, there is a story about the Baal Shem Tov that he, his brother-in-law came to say goodbye. He's going for a visit to Israel. It was the end of the summer. And he said, I want a blessing to be back for Rosh Hashanah in Meshbush. Rosh Hashanah gave him, wished him well to go on a safe trip, but he didn't mention anything about coming back for Rosh Hashanah. He left, he already smelled something is not right. He went on the he schedule, he got on the boat for Rosh Hashanah to be back in Meshbush. The boat got lost somewhere, he ended up in the middle of an island, in the middle of nowhere, Rosh Hashanah, to his luck, he had a chauffeur with him. He was traveling a whole Rosh Hashanah with his talents by himself, the only Jew, the dwarf, you know, the local people who never saw a Jew in their life. And he was crying and blowing the shofar, and they all came to look at him like this. And after Rosh Hashanah, another boat passed by, he got, he made a measure. He comes in, he comes to Meshbush, he comes right away, he runs to the Baal Shem Tov, like to complain. <laughs> he walks into the Baal Shem Tov, Baal Shem Tov, gave one look at them, he told them he was stuck in the island, huh? <laughs> he told them in this island, that was never a Jew before. This island need to be elevated. There were two options, how it should happen. Or some Jews will be exiled by a government, sent them to like a prisoner to send them to exile them, to this law. Or you should get lost for one Rosh Hashanah, and you will dive in there, and you will say brochers there, you blow the shofar there, recognize God. Now, no Jew will have to be traveled there, to be schlepped there. That's how Hasidus looks on the, all, all the, on the whole story of the Jewish people. He went to Egypt, for there 210 years. God said, do not go back to Egypt. We already fulfilled, we already elevated all the sparks from Egypt. For this reason, there is no reason to go back. And actually, if you remember, there is a Talmudic Medrash uh, that brings about the story. You remember we just read before that the Jews complained to Moses it would be better in Egypt. That the Medrash says there were four groups who had four opinions what to do. One group said, let's commit suicide. One group said, let's go to war with them. One group said, let's go back to Egypt. One group said, let's pray to God. What was the logic of the group who said, let's go back to Egypt? They said, if Hashem doesn't let us to move on, maybe we didn't finish our mission in Egypt. Maybe we have to go back, the Rebbe said it. Maybe we have to go back. Now, there's a few things you're not, you're not done yet. When you sometimes God schleps you back to the same place you thought you already done, maybe there's a few little things you need to be done. People used to go to the hospital and ask for the rabbis to tell them, maybe you should influence another Jew to put on film at least once. You'll be done with your mission in the hospital. That will push up you out of there. <laughs> you think you went there because you're sick. No, nechtiketeg. You went there because you need to do something spiritual. People go to China. They go. They think they go because of business. Here's a convention. Here's a this. Convention. That's only an excuse. It's only the, the shell. The official reason. Deep down there, God wants you to go to this place to do a few mitzvahs. God cannot give you a living in Cleveland. Everybody, there is a millions of people live here and don't have to go to China once time in their life. And you got schleps you all the way to all corners of the world. You cannot, you cannot do it today with the internet. Everything could be... God wants you to go to do some spirituality. That's why, that's the logic of not going back to Egypt. And if you end up better later to go back to Egypt by Jewish people, it was because, the everyone said it, it was because they were still spark that were not done. Therefore, eventually we went back to Egypt. And when you look on life like this, it's a whole different attitude. Where are the Jews moving now in our generation? Where is the next Jewish place? China. Mm. What? China. Mm. <laughs> moving to China. What? You'll what? see. <laughs> what I mean to say is, we have to be everywhere. Really, we were already everywhere. We were already in Iraq. and There is a, there is a reason why, look, we went to Iraq, now there's not just in Iraq. We went to all these countries, went to Poland, now there's not just... God took us from place to place throughout history to elevate the sparks. 
doesn't seem real elevated in Iraq right now. Or Syria. Or no, just the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> because it's already cleaned up from all spirituality, they went crazy. <laughs> yeah, at the point that the, I mean, England, Spain, um, etc. I mean, on and on and on in history. Um, you know, there are places where the Jews were thriving. And, from and a generation. And active culture. And, uh, and then it, it, it turned sour. Oh, oh, that was in Egypt, that was in Spain, that was in Rome, that was, it was everywhere. Yes. And, we were, and the Jews don't leave until they were thrown out, basically, because they feel if God brought them to this place, they have to elevate the spark of God in this place. And then when they, when they, when, when they are thrown out, obviously, <laughs> that's the time to move on. Then they move on to the next place. So do we really elevate the sparks in Germany? We elevated the sparks in Germany for a thousand years. You know, it's written, it's interesting you mention it. It's written you should not eat an Egyptian. Why? Because for a while they were good to us. I think it's Pasha's Gdoishim, yeah, because he was a stranger in the land, right? 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 They welcomed us in. Yeah, where is it? It's Pasha's Gdoishim for some reason, I think I remember that, right? Um, I think it's in Pasha's Gdoishim. Why do you think it's Pasha's Gdoishim? Maybe not. Um, am I maybe? It's the uh, Love the Stranger. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, where is it? I don't remember where it is, but it's... Uh, um, getting old, I don't say anything. In any case, it's really... Why? Tell me how long were we in Egypt? 230 years. 210 years? From these were eight years that we were suffering? Still God tells us, do not be, do not aid the Egyptian because they, they were welcoming you and, and when you didn't have a place to go. You know, we, we know for how long Jews were in Germany? For a thousand years. It's true, those terrible things Germany, Germany did, but this is... Mm-hmm. And there were quite a few Holocaust in Germany, not one. There were the Tach and Tad the, 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 in, the, in the Middle Age. Middle Age, there were... Terrible, destroyed many communities were you mean killed. The Crusades, them. the Crusades, Crusades yeah. and this it was in Germany. Oh, yeah. But between this and this, Jews were there for a thousand years. That we have to, we have to give them credit for whatever credit is, is due. But the idea is that now that's why we are in America. America was untouched land. That's why we are in Solon. What do you think? Why we are in Solon? There was never Jews in Solon before us. There's never a synagogue in Solomon. There's no an old ancient synagogue in Solomon. Nothing. This is the most ancient synagogue. You know, my brother in Alaska created a museum of Jewish history, the, Jew, history, the Jewish history of Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him he should make a glass box and he should sit inside because <laughs> he is the Jewish history of Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, there is a little bit of history in Alaska because they were, in 1950s, you know, there was, they, we had to bring the Yemenite Jews to Israel. The only airline that was ready to bring the Yemenite Jews from Israel was Alaska Airline. Can you believe it? Alaska, they brought like 48,000 Jews. It was an amazing story. Alaska Airline, out of nowhere, they came to schlep the Jews. And there were quite a few births of uh, ba- uh, give pe- women give birth in their on their planes, and they to take out I think the chairs because they wanted to put more people. And it was a whole thing. It was old airplanes, and it was too far. It was too far to fly. They needed to uh, refuel themselves, and they couldn't refuel on the ground. Nobody wanted to allow them to refuel. They, they took buckets of uh, uh, fuel yeah. in, in the plane, and they refueled while they were flying. An amazing story. There is actually history, Jewish history in Alaska. What do they mean to say? But not much. When the Jews, Jews in Alaska, that was in the last generation. Because God wants us to go around and to elevate the spark. That's what it's called. There is a spark of God in everything. That if you see something happens, falls in your way, it's not falling in your way. It was not an accident. God wants you to elevate something. You end up in a, you got stuck in a plane and the plane landed in a strange place. You were not planning to go there. Oh, look, I lost a half a day. Don't sit and cry for half a day. God wants you to end up in this no man's land. You should dive in there. You should do something Jewish there. Look for a Jew. Help what, them. What, what does it do when you, 
you elevate the spark in that area. That you bring it to its purpose. Not, God not created. So much that. What's it do for the person? Oh, what is there for me? <laughs> the American question. What is there for me? I'll tell you. You neshama by everything that you do more, your neshama is being elevated too. You being upgraded. Then you are getting closer to God. The more you are a messenger of God, the more you get closer to God. Think about that. You have five people who do work for you. The more they are, the more they deliver, they become closer. They get a promotion. They become the vice president. They this, they this. That's, that's the whole idea. That's why we didn't go back. We I shouldn't go back to Egypt. 